Morning. Morning. Yeah, okay. um, before we begin, let us pray. Um, Father, we thank you for your son Jesus and his saving work on the cross. That in him we have the forgiveness of sins. In him we have been reconciled to you, our creator. And in him we have everlasting life. Knowing that you have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings, we rejoice that you have begun a good work in us and you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Even so, Lord, that in times of trials and difficulties we can rejoice, for we know that the testing of our faith produces endurance, and with that we declare that we can do all things through Christ who strengthen us. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So please open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40, and we'll be reading verses 27 to 31. Isaiah 40 verses 27 to 31 says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Um, the book of Isaiah can be divided into two parts. The first half, chapters 1 to 39, provides us with a warnings and a snapshot of the rising Assyrian Empire. Um, around 700 BC, and how it attacked Jerusalem, only to be miraculously delivered by the mercy of God, as recorded in Isaiah 37, wherein the angel of the Lord struck down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers, causing them to return to their land. However, soon Babylon will come to destroy Jerusalem. And that is the preoccupation of the second half of the book, starting in chapter 40. The rabbis called Isaiah 40 to 66, the book of consolation. For no sooner than the message of disaster that the king Hezekiah received from Isaiah in Isaiah 39, verse 6 to 7, wherein he said, Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which which your fathers have stored up till this day, shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your sons, whom you, whom you will come to you, and whom you will father, shall be taken away. And they shall be eunuchs in the, in the palace of the king of Babylon. So after the message of disaster came the message of comfort, which begins in chapter 40. And it says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended and her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. You see, but these words uh, in chapter 40, uh, I mean, chapter 40 to the end of the book, speaks of a deliverance that is about 150 years in the future. And Isaiah wrote this prophetic message to comfort God's people. So in 605 BC, Jerusalem was witnessed the first wave of deportation in the hands of Babylon. And in 586 BC, the city was totally destroyed. There was death, there was destruction, there was rape, there was torture, no wonder God's people were reduced to spiritual darkness. And no wonder they, they needed the book of consolation. Remember, it was 
Isaiah who prophesied about the coming king, about the coming savior, whose government will be upon his shoulders and his kingdom will have no end. That was in chapter 9. So how can this come to pass now that you are prophesying that King Hezekiah will have no heir? His sons will be eunuchs. But we know from hindsight, Isaiah is talking about Jesus, who was born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, and he is not your normal king. But they didn't know that. Of course, God's people during that time would imagine that they were forsaken, they were forgotten. That is why Isaiah wrote this to comfort the people of God while they are waiting for the Messiah to come to deliver them from bondage and to restore them. Well, have you ever felt that? That God was far away at your time of need? You know, a similar gloom may fall on us in many and different kind of situations. Life can be disappointing. There will be constant struggles. And if you have been a Christian for quite some time and you desire to live a godly life, you know for a fact that you have a great enemy, your flesh, the world, and the devil. Not only it is true for the Christians in the pew, but also for your elders, for your pastors, for your leaders, for the workers in the church. Life, ministry, and our labor for the gospel ultimately will bring us to a crossroads of trials, toils, and temptations. And sometimes the weariness can cause us to look up and say, Why, Lord, sometimes, why? Why do you let this happen? And sometimes we begin to lose hope. And believers can have a hard time finding God in difficult times. That is why the title of this study today is Strength for the Weary, which is taken from verse 29, wherein it said, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Strength for the weary. And I pray that the Word of God brings us encouragement today to strengthen us to all of us who are weary. So where then can you find strength when you're down in the gutter? Like when you begin to have doubts in your life, in ministry, even in the church. When you began to complain, just like in verse 27 when he said, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Notice the words that are said here. Why do you say and speak? They use the imperfect tense, so you can say it like, why do you keep on saying and why do you keep on speaking? And it is describing a continuous action. And it refers to Jacob and then to Israel. Possibly the sequence is intended to recall Genesis 32, uh, verses 22 to 32, how Jacob wrestled with God. And after that, he was given a new name. It is, a, it is a, as if Isaiah is telling us, you should not be complaining. You should not be wrestling like Jacob. You're Israel now with a new name. You have a new strength. You have a new vision. You have a new purpose. But he said, my way is hidden. And that's in perfect tense, meaning that it is, he has settled the fact in his mind. He said, that's it. I am... I'm sure of it that God has hidden uh, his way from me, uh, from my way is hidden from him. And he said, my right or my cause is disregarded. Another imperfect tense, a continuous experience. What he's saying is that my situation is getting forgotten by the Lord. And you know what he said? My, my cause is being disregarded by my God. You notice that? A sort of like um, per perplexity. And he was saying, huh? How can my God do this? I'm weary, Lord, and I can't understand what is happening. Isaiah gives us two counsels for the weary to find strength. To look up and to wait. To look up for the first question is theological. 
No, he, he, the question is about the nature of God. My way is hidden from the Lord. Is the Lord really hiding? And other one is to wait. For the second question is exper- experiential, for it touches the experience of his people. My right is disregarded by my God. He never answers my prayers. Why would the Lord allow this? Why maybe he has forgotten me? So we need to look up the two counsel. First is to look up. Look unto God. You know, God challenges unbelief and doubt for being the crippling illness to his people. And then he answered, Have you not known? Have you not heard? He didn't say, Do you know? Or have you heard? But he said, Have you not known? Have you not heard? For the solution to the problem of weariness that causes doubt and to find strength to move on is to relearn what you have already known and open your ears to what you have already been told. Isaiah is saying, I'm not going to tell you something new, for you knew already. And I'm also telling you that what I am telling you is not new. And if you are a believer, you already know the truth and you possess the truth. You have the mind of Christ, but you needed to be reminded. For we always look in different directions and we, need to, we needed to be reminded of who God is. The Lord is the everlasting God, creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. To look up is to behold your God. The Lord, notice this, it's all capitals. It's not the regular word that we see that is capital L and then small letters. This is all capital, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It is the name Yahweh. It identifies the Lord as the self-existent one. Every other being in the universe depends upon some other being for its existence. God depends on no one. He exists within himself, by himself, and for himself. It is the Lord. The Lord is the everlasting God. This is the name Elohim Olam. His name identifies God as the eternal God. There has never been a time when he wasn't, and there will never be a time when he isn't. He existed when there was nothing but him, and he will always exist, and he is not bound in time. Psalm 90 verse 2 said, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you have formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is creator. His name identifies him as the one who made everything out of nothing. The God who has the power to create the world with just his word. That is the God we serve. Not only he is a creator, but creator of the ends of the earth. Psalms 139 verse 8 says, If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. It means that you can trust God in every situation, in all places. Wherever you find yourself, God is in charge, for he created all things. God is untiring. He does not faint or grow weary. God never becomes fatigued, despite the fact that he is upholding all things by the word of his power. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says. Psalms 121 verse, verses 3 to 5 says, He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep, will neither slumber nor sleep. He never grows tired from his work. We should never doubt his capacity. God has infinite wisdom. His understanding is unsearchable, unfathomable. His knowledge is beyond our human comprehension. His understanding is too great for us to begin to know. How then can we expect to understand all these ways? Psalm 147 verse 5 says, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. 
His understanding is beyond measure. Behold your God. Remember this message was given to God's people that will undergo captivity, deportation from the, from the promised land. To the people who are experiencing weariness, doubt, and hopelessness. Well, we can find application also to our own lives when we are weary, when we are in doubt, and we are hopeless. Have you not known? Have you not heard? As God of eternity, He does not change. As Creator, He is clothed with glory and majesty. As untiring, He will not cease or abandon His purpose or pause them because He needs to sleep. And, because, and with regards to His wisdom, we cannot fault His discernment for we cannot fathom His understanding. So there is something wrong when we say that God is too great to care for us. But the right one to say is that God is too great to fail, for He'll never fail. His ways are eternal. Our ways are bound in time. His vision is for the whole creation. Our focus is just regional. Isaiah 55 verses 8 to 9 said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Behold your God, lift up your eyes, and see. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. Isaiah 45 verse 5. Understand then, knowing these things, this brings strength. It is not our strength that's being promoted here, but strength in Him, in the everlasting, in the all-powerful God, in the all-sustaining, never-tiring God. That is where you'll find your strength. And God is the giver of strength. In verse 29, it said, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Psalm 121, verse 1 and 2 said, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. It is He who gives power to the weak, to the ones who acknowledges they are weak, to the ones who have nothing to rely on, nothing to depend on, who has no might. Paul understand this when he said in 2 Corinthians 12, verses, 8, for verses 9 to 10, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest off on me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God's power in weakness. Psalm 73 verse 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. To look up is to behold your God, and then to wait. What kind of waiting is in view here? The word used for wait is sometimes translated as hope, and sometimes uh, expectation, with a biblical dimension of certainty, which includes waiting patiently, trusting, and resting. This passage points us not to look into our situation and troubles, but to look on the Lord with faith, trusting Him with expectation, and not simply looking, but taking the hard look at who God is in His character, in His being, through His words and His promises. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. Lamentations 3 verse 25. Psalm 27 verse 14 says, Wait for the Lord, be strong, 
Take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 33 verse 20 says, We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Isaiah 40 verse 30 said, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Isaiah plays a contrast here as if to make a point. Life shows that merely human resources, they will fail. Youth here is a general word for the young male, chosen for the man, chosen, the chosen man in their prime, the fighting men, men in their military age, men in their peak condition. But the implication here is that even these youths have limits. And the point here is that if you put your trust in men, in your strength, you will be disappointed. But in contrast, he said, these youths, these youths, even these youths, but they who wait on the Lord, even though they may be weary, if they wait for the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They are promised a renewed strength, a different kind of strength, where they will be keep on putting fresh strength, strength that is not natural. As in Psalms 103 verse 5, where it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. For those who wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And there is a promise here that those who wait on the Lord, those who wait on Him will have a renewed strength, renewed strength to soar, strength to run, and strength to walk. And if any of you have been watching the Avengers, the superhero Avengers, you know they have this shot in the movie wherein they were lined up, you know, superheroes. Um, and they began to walk, you know, they start to walk and then they would sprint. And, uh, and then at the end, as if they began to jump with might towards their enemy. You know, a very climatic scene. Well, this is not that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the, com on the com commentary says, it mentioned that what Isaiah is telling us is called the descending climax. You know, it begins up with mounting up, soaring up, and then run, and then you walk. It's very anticlimactic. But what is Isaiah saying here? God's people will enjoy amazing provision of strength from the Lord through various, various trials or various vistas in our lives. You know, the strength to soar, there will be moments in our life that we would feel exhausted, hard-pressed. You know, at times you'll be like giving up, you feel defeated, you're unable to get up. And regardless of how your spiritual life had been, the Lord is saying there is help, there is grace. And for the promise to those who will wait on Him will have renewed strength. The promise to soar, to mount up with wings as eagles, as if to ascend on heights. Well, you have heard this illustration how eagles would flap its wings and it ascends to heights, you know, above the storm, above the clouds. The message for us is that the Lord promises us to provide strength so that we can surmount even the hardest trials in our lives by His abounding grace. Remember Paul on his letter to the Philippians when he said, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. He said, I press on toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. That is in Philippians 3, 13-14. But when Paul wrote these words, you know where he is? He was in Roman prison, chained to a guard, awaiting for his trial for the cause of the gospel. But he was soaring above his situation by grace in his weakness. That is why he can de declare that one thing I do, I press on. 
There is strength to soar and there is strength to run, meaning to dash, to sprint. And we know that the Christian life has been uh, called like a race. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 to 8, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous God, will award on me uh, on that day, not only to me, but also to all who had loved his appearing. Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us, cling so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and that is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. God gives strength to those who wait on him as they live the Christian life. And as Paul describes his ministry, he said, my ministry is like dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, gen danger from city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil, hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. How did he continue on? Only through depending daily on the rightful, dependable source, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he said in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16, So we do not lose heart, that even though our, our outer self is being wasted away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. The Lord will give strength for us to press on, and to continue the race if we are determined to wait on Him. Strength to soar, strength to run, strength to walk. And this is the, what I say, uh, the commentator said, the descending climax. The climax of God's renewing strength. If we are resolved, even in our times of weariness, to wait upon Him, to wait upon the Lord, God promised the strength to walk so that you won't faint. But what does the Bible say about walking? The book of Genesis said that Enoch walked with God and was no more because God has taken him. Micah 6 verse 8, verse 8 says, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Ephesians 2 verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Galatians 5 verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Colossians 2 verse 6, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus our Lord, so walk with Him. 1 John 2 verse 6, whoever says he abide in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Brothers and sisters, there will be seasons that we will soar through our trials. There will be times we are running busy for the Lord. But most of the times, we will be walking with the Lord in our daily Christian life and ministry. And there is nothing bigger than a Christian who walks simply with his Lord, faithfully spending time with the Lord in prayer, in his word, day by day by day. And God gives his strength even for that. And that's a wonderful picture. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you for an, uh, that you is our God, an everlasting God, our creator. Thank you that you never tire of hearing our prayers. Thank you for your graciousness to us. 
Thank you for the promise of strength to us, the strength to press on the Christian life, the strength to soar above our troubles, the strength to follow you in our daily walk. Thank you that these are available to us through your Son, Jesus, whom you have given to the world for the forgiveness of sins, who died on the cross on our behalf and was risen from the dead and now seated at your right hand, our blessed hope, whom we wait for his coming again. Grant us your grace that in any circumstance of our life, in our time of our weakness, that we may look only to you for strength, to acknowledge that we are weak and in need of your strength, to trust in you and you alone, to walk by faith and not by sight. Amen.